Welcome, BGCSI family. Thank you for tuning in again. Yet again, we're doing our online book club hosted by Mr. Kurt. And I'm going to give everyone a second for those that are tuning in. Go ahead, hit that share button, hit that like button, leave a comment, leave an emoji. Go ahead, bring the kids in, tell them to get off the Fortnite and the YouTube and all the games and stuff. And tell them to come sit down and have a nice little book time with Mr. Kurt. If you don't know, this is your first time tuning in. We are doing the book by Gary Paulson. It is called Hatchet. It is a great coming of age story about a young boy named Brian Roberson who is traveling to Canada on a small small single plane airplane um, to meet up with his father and a whole lot ensues that have been going into. So a brief recap, we have a lot of cliffhangers. This morning we left you with a big one. Um, matter of fact, the last few lines, it says that a color came that he'd never seen before, a color that exploded in his mind with the pain and he was gone, gone from it all, spiraling out into the world, spiraling out into nothing. Nothing. So he's on his plane now, and the plane finally crashes, and then we have nothing. So we are going to continue on with chapter four and see where this takes us in the adventures of Mr. Brian Roberson. Everybody ready? You got everybody tuned in? All righty. So the memory was like a knife cutting into him, slicing deep into him with hate. The secret. He'd been riding his 10 speed with a friend named Terry. They had been taking a run on a bike trail and decided to come back a different way, a way that took him past the Amber Mall. Brian remembered everything in incredible detail. Remember the time on the bank clock in the mall flashing 331, then the temperature, 82 degrees, and the date. All the numbers were part of the memory. All of his life was part of the memory. Terry had first turned to smile at him about something and Brian looked over Terry's head and saw her, his mother. She was sitting in the station wagon, a strange wagon. He saw her and she did not see him. Brian was going to wave or call out, but something stopped him. There was a man in the car. Short blonde hair the man had, wearing some kind of white pullover tennis shirt. Brian saw this and more, saw the secret and saw more later. But the memory came in pieces, came in scenes like this, Terry smiling, Brian looking over his head to see the station wagon and his mother sitting with the man, the time and the temperature clock, the front wheel of his bike, the short blonde hair of the man, the white shirt of the man, the hot hate slices of the memory were exact, the secret. Brian opened his eyes and screamed. For seconds, he didn't know where he was, only that the crash was still happening and he was going to die. And he screamed until his breath was gone. Then silence, filled with sobs as he pulled in air, half crying. How could it be so quiet? Moments ago, there was nothing but noise, crashing and tearing, screaming, not quiet. Some birds were singing. How could birds be singing? His legs felt wet, and he raised up his hand and looked down at them. They were in the lake. Strange. They went down into the water. He tried to move, but pain hammered into him and made his breath shorten into gasp, and he stopped, his legs still in the water. Pain. Memory. He turned again, and the sun came across the water. Late sun cut into his eyes and made him turn away. It was over then. The crash. He was alive. The crash is over, and I'm alive, he thought. Then his eyes closed, and he lowered his head for minutes that seemed longer. When he opened them again, it was evening and some of the sharp pain had abated. There were many dull aches, and the crash came fully back to him. Into the trees and onto the lake, the plane crashed and sunk in the lake, and he had somehow pulled free. He raised himself and crawled out the water, grunting with the pain of the movement. His legs were on fire, and his forehead felt as if someone had been pounding on it with a hammer, but he could move. He pulled his legs out the lake and crawled on his hands and knees until they were a ways away on the wet, soft shore near a small strand of brush of some kind. Then he went down, only this time to rest. To say something of himself, he lay on his side and put his head on his arm and closed his eyes, because that's all he could do now. All he could think of being able to do, he closed his eyes and slept, dreamless, deep, and down. There was almost no light when he opened his eyes again, the darkness of the night was thick, and for a moment he began to panic. To see, he thought, to see is everything, and he could not see. 
But he turned his head without moving his body and saw that across the lake, the sky was a light gray, that the sun was starting to come up. And he remembered that it had been evening when he went to sleep. Must be morning now, he mumbled, almost in a hoarse whisper. As the thickness of sleep left him and the world came back, he was still in pain, all over pain. His legs were cramped and drawn up, tight and aching, and his back hurt when he tried to move. Worst was the keen throbbing in his head that pulsed with every beat of his heart. It seemed that the whole crash had happened to his head. He rolled on his back and felt his sides and his legs. Moving things slowly, he rubbed his arms. Nothing seemed to be shattered or even sprained at all that badly. When he was nine, he had plowed a small dirt bike into a parked car and broken his ankle. Had to wear a cast for eight weeks, and there was nothing now like that. Nothing broken, just batted around a bit. His forehead felt massively swollen to the touch, almost like a mound out over his eyes. And it was so tender that when his fingers grazed it, he nearly cried. But there was nothing he could do about it. Like the rest of him, it seemed to be bruised more than broken. I'm alive, he thought. I'm alive. It could have been different. There could have been death. It could have been done. Like the pilot, he thought suddenly. The pilot in the plane, down in the water, down into the blue water strapped in the sea. He sat up, or tried to. The first time he fell back. But on the second attempt, grunting with effort, he managed to come to a sitting position and scrunched sideways until his back was against a small tree where he sat feeling, feeling the lake, watching the sky get lighter and lighter with the coming dawn. His clothes were wet and clammy, and there was a faint chill. He pulled the torn remnants of his windbreaker pieces really around his shoulder and tried to hold what heat he could in his body. He could not think, could not make thought patterns work right. Things seemed to go back and forth between reality and imagination, except that it was all reality. One second, he seemed to have imagined that there was a plane crash and that he had fought out the sinking plane and swum to shore, that it all had happened to some other person or in a movie playing in his mind. Then he would feel his clothes wet and cold, and his forehead would slash a pain through his thoughts that he knew it was real, that it had really happened, but all in a haze, all in a haze world. So he sat and stared at the lake, felt the pain come and go in ways, and watched the sun come over the end of the lake. It took an hour, perhaps two. He could not measure time yet. He didn't care. For the sun to get halfway up, when it did, though, it came with some warmth. Small bits of it at first, and with the heat came clouds of insects, thick, swarming hordes of mosquitoes that flocked to his body, made a living coat on his exposed skin, clogged his nostrils when he inhaled, poured into his mouth when he opened it to take a breath. It was not possible. It was not possibly believable. Not this. He had come through the crash, but the insects were not possible. He coughed them up and spat them out, sneezed them out, closed his eyes and kept brushing his face, slapping and crushing them by the dozen, by the hundreds. But as soon as he cleared a place, as soon as he killed them, more came, thick, whining, buzzing masses of them. Mosquitoes and some black flies he had never seen before, all biting, chewing, and taking from him. In moments, his eyes were swollen shut and his face puny and round to match his battered forehead. He pulled the torn pieces of his windbreak over his head and tried to shelter it in it, but the jacket was full of rips and it didn't work. In desperation, he pulled his t-shirt over his face, but that exposed the skin of his lower backs and the mosquitoes and flies attacked the new soft flesh of his back so viciously that he pulled the shirt down. In the end, he sat with the windbreaker pulled up, brushed with his hands and took it and almost crying in frustration and agony. There was nothing left to do. And when the sun was fully up and heating him directly, bringing steam off his wet clothes and bathing him in warmth, the mosquito and flies disappeared. Almost that suddenly. One minute, they were, he was sitting in the middle of a swarm. The next, they were gone and the sun was on them. Vampires, he thought. Apparently, they didn't like the sun. His clothes were wet and clammy, and there was a faint chill. He pulled the torn remnants of his windbreakers, pieces really, around his shoulders, and tried to hold what heat his body could. Things seemed to go back and forth and back and forth. It took an hour, perhaps two. He could not measure the time yet and didn't care for the sun to get halfway up. It came with some warmth. It was not possible. It's hard. Ugh, he pulled himself up to stand against the street, the tree and stretch. 
bringing new aches and pains. His back muscles must have been hurt as well. They almost seemed to tear when he stretched. And while the pain in his forehead seemed to be abating somewhat, trying to stand made him weak enough to nearly collapse. The back of his hands were puffy and his eyes were swollen shut, and everything he saw through a narrow squint. Not that there was much to see, he thought. Scratching the bites in front of him lay the blue and the blue and deep. He had a sudden picture of the pain, plane, sunk in the lake, down and down, with the pilot body still strapped in the seat, his hair waving. He shook his head. More pain. That wasn't something to think about. He looked at his surroundings again. The leg stretched out slightly below him. He was at the base of the L, looking up the long part, and the short part was out to his right. In the morning light, the calm water was absolutely perfectly still. He could see the reflections of the trees at the other end of the lake. Upside down in the water, they seemed almost like another forest. An upside down forest to match the real one. As he watched a large bird, he thought, it looked like a crow, but it seemed larger, flew on top. Everything was green, so green it went into him. The forest was largely made up of pines and spruce, with strands of some low brush smeared here and there, and thick grass and some other kind of very small brush all over. He couldn't identify most of it, except the evergreens, and some leafy trees he thought might be aspen. He seen pictures of aspens in the mountains on televisions. The, countries, the, count, the country around the lake was moderately hilly, but the hills were small, almost hummocks, and there were very few rocks except to his left. There lay a rocky ridge that struck out overlooking the lake about 20 feet high. If the plane had come down a little to the left, it would have hit the rocks and never made the lakes. He would have been smashed, destroyed. The word came. I would have been destroyed and torn and smashed, driven into the rocks and destroyed. Luck, he thought. I have luck. I had good luck there, but he knew that was wrong. If he had good luck, his parents wouldn't have divorced because of the secret, and he wouldn't have been flying with the pilot who had a heart attack, and he wouldn't be here if he had the good luck to keep him from being destroyed. If you keep walking back from good luck, he thought, you'll come to bad luck. He shook his head again, wincing, another thing not to think about. The rocky ridge was rounded and seemed to be some kind of standstone, sandstone with bits of darker stone layered and stuck into it. Directly across the lake from it, at the inside corner of the L, was a mound of sticks and mud rising up out the water a good eight or ten feet. At first, Brian couldn't place, place it, but he knew, he knew that somehow he knew what it was. He had seen it in films. Then a small brown head popped to the surface of the water near the mound and began swimming off down the short leg of the L, leaving a V of ripples, and he remembered where he had seen it. It was a beaver house, called a beaver lodge, in a special he had seen on the public channel. A fish jumped, not a large fish, but it made a big splash near the beaver. And as if by a signal, there were suddenly little slops of all over the sides of the lake along the shore, as fish began jumping, hundreds of them, jumping and slapping the water. Brian watched them for a time, still in the half days, still not thinking well. The scenery was very pretty, he thought, and there were new things to look at, but it was all green and blue blur, and he was used to the gray and black of the city, the sounds of the city, traffic, people talking, sounds all the time the hum and whine of the city. Here at first it was silent, or he thought it was silent, but when he stared to listen, really listen, he heard things, thousands of things, hisses and blurks, small sounds, bird sounds, hum of insects, splashes from the fish jumping. There was a great noise here, but a noise he did not know, and the colors were new to him and the colors and noise mixed in his mind to make a green blue blur that he could hear and hear a hissing pulse sound and he was still tired, so tired, so awfully tired. And standing had taken a lot of energy somehow. It had drained him. He supposed he was still in some kind of shock from the crash and there was still the pain, the dizziness, the strange feeling. He found another tree, a tall pine with no branches until the top and sat with a back against it looking down at the lake with the sun warming him. In a few minutes, he scrunched down and he was asleep again. Well, that concludes chapter four. And and, and if you see here, we're in a, a, a predicament because Brian is now realizing how big of an issue he really is in. He's out on the lake. He's hurt, but he doesn't know how he's hurt or why he's hurt. He has these aches and pains and he's 
seeing everything around him and observing it and soaking it in, but he's still realizing that he's by himself and he's falling asleep yet again. What's going to happen in chapter five? What do you think? Eventually he's going to need food. He's going to need shelter. He's going to need to try to find a way out. I wonder how he's going to do those things. Well, if you want to know, want to find out, please join us tomorrow. We'll be doing chapter five and a review of chapter three and four tomorrow morning at 12 noon, right during lunchtime. Grab you something to eat. Come by here as we'll be giving out food between 12 and 1.30 and tune in for our next broadcast. And then tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. we'll be continuing on with chapter six as well. So I know I'm excited and I look forward to seeing what happens next. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Please don't forget to share. Please don't forget to like and leave comments. And we'll see you guys tomorrow.